Amazing. So, good morning, everybody. Um, so, today we are talking about interreality materiality. And before we get into the content of our talk, we just wanted to say we're going to use the terms game and non game world just to kind of differentiate between um, the video game and this space. But we're not trying to set up some kind of dichotomy here. Actually, hopefully, those terms will just provide us with clarity to explore points of connection and commonality. Um, so yes, without further ado, we will introduce ourselves and our avatars. So I'm Jess, and when we play Elder Scrolls Online, I become Feline, and she is a dark elf necromancer, and if you knew me, you would know that dark elf is not how people would describe my personality. <laughs> I'm far more bubbly and light, um, so there's a real sort of transition there when I enter into the game world. And my name is Katie, and this is my in-game avatar, and I've kind of gone the opposite way of, like... She, she's kind of who I would like to be, <laughs> kind of in the opposite. Um, she is a Nord Templar. Um, so our background is um, we met excavating a prehistoric landscape that you can see in this photo here with Oxford Archaeology on behalf of National Highways and Kia um, called the A585 Windy Harbour Road Scheme and it's near Blackpool. And because it was the COVID years, we had to be a bit inventive about how to socialise with our new colleagues, and so we started playing Elder Scrolls Online together, which I will now refer to as ESO. Um, so Elder Scrolls Online is part of the Elder Scrolls franchise that has um, been mentioned this morning already. For those who aren't aware, this version of it is a huge multiplayer game, um, which is constantly growing. It's, uh, it has new areas added to it about every three months, is it? Yeah. Um, features many of the same locations, races, and even some familiar faces from the other Elder Scrolls games that you might recognize. So ESO is the game world within which our non-game world friendship matured. <laughs> we got to know one another, we discussed our working interpretations of the site we were on, and we even celebrated our shared birthday with real world sweet rolls. Um, our dogs are related. And we've bought each other gifts, we've helped each other build parts of our homes. So it's really no exaggeration when we say that our lives within this game have, have sort of materially altered our non-game lives. Um, however, the complexity of that assemblage is not immediately apparent in the associated material culture that we use to facilitate it. Um, that being the consoles, game discs and controllers that make it all possible. So this experience of objects acting as conduits led us to two connected observations. Firstly, that if we experience very tangible other worlds through objects, is it possible that past societies had similar experiences? Navigating other worlds through objects like our controllers do for us, that themselves lead little trace of these alternative spaces and are therefore perhaps at risk of being misunderstood. And secondly, do our experiences in the game in any way offer us reasonable insight into what those past experiences might have been like? Arguably, it would take an entire presentation to begin to even address one of these points. However, for us, they were really very intimately linked, and so we will endeavour to address both of them. Now, the notion of past societies experiencing other worlds is not a new theoretical concept to archaeology or anthropology. As a guiding principle, let it suffice to say that the acceptance of multiple worlds is an important step in not presupposing that other beliefs are wrong or ritual, simply because they do not fit with our known world and our understanding. On the topic of presupposing, we are not in any way suggesting that past societies experienced other worlds in exactly the same way as we do. Rather, we are arguing that if we accept that we inhabit other worlds in our own culture, we can conceive that there were other worlds accessed and lived in the past. In a recent publication, Harris outlines the challenges of a post-humanist archaeology, one of those being that our attempt to understand past ontologies demands that we adopt an approach that allows the full range of past experience to emerge. <laughs> As a fantasy world removed yet informed by past and present cultures and experiences, could ESO be a landscape that allows these differences to emerge? In order to situate our understanding of these ontologies regarding material <coughs> culture, we reflected on our past quests and we were reminded of the Waterstone. 
And this quest was particularly pertinent to us because we played it while we were on site at Windy Harbour, that site where we met, and it challenged us to think differently about the deposition of material culture as we were bringing it out of the ground. Um, so this quest involved oops, sorry, <laughs> um, many elements that spoke to us of ways to understand material culture recovered from depositional practices. Mm -hmm. Um, the quest was delivered to us by Harold Kasakthi, a follower of the Daedric Prince Hermaeus Mora, who asks you to investigate activity in some ruins. Um, you discover there that there is a Nereid, who is a water spirit, and she wants to flood the ruins to reverse the drying up of a nearby lake. Um, so to do this, she needs to make a water stone, and uh, that comes at a cost whereby her followers, the Rain Disciples, will sacrifice their memories, some willingly, some unwillingly. <laughs> and uh, at this point, the quest actually branches. And so I chose to help the Nereid by collecting the Aeliad relics and destroying them in order to make the water stone. Whereas Jess um, helped the Herald, who follows Hermaeus Mora, to undermine the Nereid and to allow the landscape to continue on its path of change. Uh, many elements of the ontology of Tamriel are highlighted in this quest and the creation of the Waterstone uh, that opened up our minds to new interpretations of object deposition within prehistory. Uh, not necessarily that this game represents a full or concrete explanation for prehistoric deposition, but that what the game designers have created here offers an example of what might emerge from the assemblage of water, humans and stone. I know it's perhaps an obvious point, but within this quest, we experience different worlds. Tamriel being in the Nern, which is the mortal world, and Hermaeus Mora's realm uh, from Oblivion, the Daedric Plane. And we don't want to get sidetracked by talking about worlds within worlds within worlds. <laughs> um, however, we just thought it was an important observation that if we're looking to video games for insight to the past, here too we see multiple worlds connecting and entwining. Um, so one line from the narrative of this quest that really caught our attention was that all the memories of Tamriel's history are stored in its waters. And at locations around Britain, such as Clincarrick Back or even in the Thames, where watery places are the location of depositional practices, there often seems to be a strong sense of generational memory. Um, for example, at the site we were working on in Windy Harbour. Um, so this is an overview of the wetland site that we were working on, and it features an extremely long period of really similar depositional activity, which ranges from the end of the Mesolithic through to the beginning of the Neolithic. Um, so this was a massive period that was witness to many monumental societal changes, and yet people still return to these same places to perform practically the same acts of deposition with really similar materials. Um, this tells us that throughout a period of climactic shift in the form of marine transgressions of this valley that you're looking at, um, there was still a real pull to this watery place, which may have become quite inaccessible at times. Um, so why? Playing through this quest invited us to interrogate the possibility of a world where the water was not just remembered across generations, but where the water was the body of memory itself. <coughs> Um, so the act of creating the stone in preparation was also really interesting from an archaeological perspective um, because the quest starts with you stealing relics <laughs> of an earlier civilization <laughs> and then destroying them on, a, uh, on the Nereid's altar over which the disciples' memories have been sacrificed. Um, and then the destruction of this relic then draws out the memories to create the water stone. Um, and materially, this was just a fascinating concept because the memory is water, it becomes object, essence, stone, and then it goes back to water again. Um, and this process uh, really illustrated to us the idea that the materials are always in the process of becoming, um, as we've all heard, and that this concept has been built into video gaming, uh, what we assume is subconsciously, I may be wrong, um, shows its relevance to understanding practices and sort of the nature of human behavior over time. Um, so with this concept in mind, we sort of looked at more depositional practices from the site that we were working on. And um, at Windy Harbour, one practice we observed was the intentional breaking up of Neolithic Langdale axes before depositing them in paleo channels, peat bogs and tree throws. And uh, the parallels with these stories are really clear, but what does this suggest about the world that these objects inhabited? 
Uh, whilst object biographical theories might posit this moment is the death of the artefacts or from an economic perspective, one might call it deliberate stifling of use or removing it from circulation completely. But as Bradley and Ed Edmonds noted, we have said enough to show that the movement of stone axes cannot be studied in terms of modern economic principles. So if we're then to follow the vein of thought provided to us within this quest and the ontologies of Tamriel, um, maybe we could now perceive the destruction of these artefacts as some form of release. Perhaps instead we're looking at a world where the destruction of an object was its purpose, the beginning of its intended life, and what if objects were valued because of the ability to become a memory and power, and that the destruction of them rather than ending this was the moment in which it was given life and purpose. Perhaps like within this quest, the object is used for its properties to combat climactic shifts and feed the water sources, um, as opposed to the place being a material graveyard. Cool. So the water stone was not the only quest that asked us to destroy objects and through doing so to change the fate of a society. Our second case study for this presentation is The Thin Ones. So you discover a village of people who sold their souls to Clavicus Vile, we've already heard about him this morning, um, who was another Daedric prince from Oblivion, to save themselves from a sickness. And after you kind of gain their trust, you do some things to become their friends, they reveal their true nature to you. Uh, it turns out that Clavicus Vile trapped their souls in a soul gem and left them in this skeletal state between life and death as a way of preserving them from the sickness. And these people then ask you for help um, because the worm cultists have stolen this soul gem and so therefore their lives and their um, society is at risk and they ask you to recover it for them. Simple, I hear you say, but no. As it turns out, the energies protecting the relic kill living creatures who touch it. And so we request to make an offering to Clavicus Vile. And really we should have known what was going to happen, but we were tricked and we ourselves turned into skeletons um, because depositing this totem into the brazier at the temple turned us this way. Um, clearly, Clavicus Vile likes making people think they're getting one thing and giving something else instead. So in this case, however, rather than changing a landscape, the act of deposition changed us. Our physical selves were altered and as skeletons, we were then able to interact with the sacred object of the soul gem. Now, this bodily change brought about by the formation of a new assemblage harks back to theoretical discussions by Canella on the materials from Star Car. She offers an explanation of the way that red deer animal remains may have offered those depositing or wearing them animal effects. As these new assemblages form, they are in a manner becoming deer. Now, once we recovered the soul gem, we were asked to de then determine the fate of the villagers. Why they are asking strangers to decide their fate, I don't know, maybe it was easier to ask somebody else rather than make that decision themselves. But we could either freeze the soul gem and keep them in their undead state, or burn it and release their souls from the curse. As with the water stone, we each chose a different option, but no matter our choice, we were left with the ability to turn into skeletons at will. Now again in this quest, the destruction of an artefact through deposition released energies, in this case souls, changing the community connected with it. This example is perhaps closer to the theories we discussed earlier of destruction and deposition as the death of an object, or in this case the death of a society. We also found ourselves challenged by these quests to think of deposition not as the lone act of an individual, which is how we found ourselves talking about it most typically on site, um, but as the action of an assemblage of people, objects and landscapes which come together, as an act which requires the sacrifice of many and changes a community and the places around them permanently. Now you can see through how playing games we not only found new interpretations of material culture, but also case studies to challenge and enhance our existing understandings. And there are many other elements of these quests and the ontologies within them which we could have discussed. You may have picked up on some of them yourselves and kind of be itching to, to think about them a little bit more, um, such as the pressures of climate change and sickness on communities to the role of conflict. I mean, there was a lot of fighting in these quests that you haven't seen. Um, but as always in a conference, we just don't have time to address all of these processes of becoming. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, to bring it back to the points we were making, at the start of this presentation, we asked, whether it was possible that past societies experienced other worlds through objects and wondered what those experiences might have been like. Um, to answer the former, contextualising video games within the material record made us starkly aware of the role of objects as conduits that can connect you to other worlds. 
Um, to put it plainly, gaming offered us a framework to get comfortable with the premise that human experience is not just limited to one world or one reality, um, and it challenged us to be more open to interpretations that embrace the other, and that it's very possible that past societies experienced other tangible worlds. Now, whilst our gaming to date hasn't necessarily shown us exactly what these past experiences were like, there was a key theme across our case studies that the act of deposition brought the Daedric and mortal realms of Oblivion and Tamriel together, with deposited artefacts acting as conduits in much the same way as our own controllers, an observation which we think is worth further consideration and research. Now, as Harris rightly states, it would be wrong to assume that the existence of multiple worlds means that they are distinctly different. Our experiences in the game world coincide with our non-game. Of an evening, we'll be running through marshland depositing stones in a wetland environment to find ourselves, and I speak from personal <coughs> experience, uh, on site the following morning knee-deep in Neolithic peat. Uh, it's a playful statement, however, it's a personal demonstration of how these two worlds, the game and the non-game, are not so far removed from one another. And therefore, perhaps, our interpretations of archaeological societies based on our in-game experiences are not so far-fetched either. So I'd say thank you very much for listening. And if you happen to play on Xbox, you are welcome to join us and hang out. <laughs>